Hello and welcome to The Edge, where we take an in-depth analysis of today's top stories by looking beyond the edge. We'll bring you not just the facts, but also deep insights into the topics with expert opinions and social media reactions. Let's make a start with our look beyond the edge. U.S. President Joe Biden began his first overseas trip since taking office by hailing America's unwavering commitment to the NATO alliance and warning Russia that it would face robust and meaningful consequences if it engages in harmful activities. Biden is in the United Kingdom because Johnson is hosting the G7 summit in what has been touted as Britain's big return to the international arena. What will be the outcome of the meeting for Joe Biden? Johnson and the other G7 leaders. Europe has begun to reopen its borders to travellers from outside the continent and the European Union has announced the launch of its digital COVID certificate, which many hope will allow freedom of movement around the bloc. Already nine countries are using the scheme to issue certificates, with more expected to join before a formal launch on the 1st of July. Does one need to be vaccinated to get it? Do different vaccines affect the certificates? And already delayed by one year, Euro 2020 finally kicks off in Rome on Friday, but with a very different feel from previous competitions. 24 teams will battle for supremacy across 11 cities, with about half a million spectators expected to attend. But which is the most difficult group and what will the atmosphere be like? So these are the top three stories that we'll be taking a look at today from Beyond the Edge. Let's get started. Diplomatic relations between the EU and the United States date back to 1953. It's one of the most important bilateral relationships in the world. Our following infographic has more. Biden will be the 13th sitting U.S. president to meet with Queen Elizabeth II when he visits Windsor Castle outside London on Sunday. Let's take a look at the previous encounters between the now 95-year-old monarch and American presidents. Imagine trying to make an impression on someone who has met, well, almost everyone. Such is the challenge for U.S. President Joe Biden, who will meet Queen Elizabeth II on Sunday at Windsor Castle outside London. During her nearly 70-year reign, Queen Elizabeth II has met nearly every U.S. president since Dwight Eisenhower, except for Lyndon Johnson, who didn't visit Britain while he was in office. In 1961, President John Kennedy is seen with First Lady Jackie, the Queen and Prince Philip at Buckingham Palace. Even before he was president, Richard Nixon spent time with the Queen. As vice president, he escorted the Queen and Prince Philip on their visit to the United States in 1957. In February 1969, Richard Nixon, as president, dined with the Queen and visited Prime Minister Harold. President Gerald Ford danced gracefully with Queen Elizabeth at a state dinner in 1976, when she traveled to the United States to observe the bicentennial. 
In May 1977, the Queen hosted President Jimmy Carter on his first overseas trip at a dinner for NATO leaders at Buckingham Palace. This is my first overseas trip because of the historical ties that have always bound the United States of America and the United Kingdom together in a special and very precious relationship. President Ronald Reagan and First Lady Nancy were the first presidential couple to be invited to stay overnight at Windsor Castle. In 1991, Queen Elizabeth made her third state visit to the United States. She bestowed the Winston Churchill Foundation Award on Bush. Your country and mine have together shown that freedom works. In 1995, the Band of the Walsh Guards turned out in full ceremonial dress for President Bill Clinton and First Lady Hillary. Later, President George W. Bush and First Lady Laura welcomed the Queen and her husband, Prince Philip, to the White House. But talk we will, listen we have to, disagree from time to time we may, but united we must always remain. President Barack Obama and First Lady Michelle stayed at Buckingham Palace for two days, where the Queen gave them a state dinner. During President Trump's 2018 visit, he reportedly spent more than 45 minutes having tea with the Queen. Biden will be the 13th sitting U.S. president to meet with the now 95-year-old monarch. Her personal ties to American leaders underscore the importance of the United States to the United Kingdom and to the Queen. And I'm joined live from London by Tom Packer, who's an honorary research fellow at the Institute of the Americas. Tom, thank you for joining us again here today on The Edge. The weather was good to welcome Joe Biden to England yesterday. He's begun his first trip outside the, the United States since becoming president. Uh, what is the importance of this, uh, of this visit from, from Joe Biden's perspective? I, I, I think he will be chiefly focused on the G7, unsurprisingly, and the commitments he wants out of the G7. I think on a policy point of view, he'd like something significant on China, which... I think he, like most American foreign policy establishment, thinks is America's number one strategic problem at the moment. Um, I think from a personal point of view, he'd like stories that our world loves American president again, Joe Biden, much more popular than Trump, which shouldn't be that difficult, um, given how much the G7 establishment dislike Trump. Um, in terms of the bilateral British agreement, I think Joe Biden is always very keen to be friends with everyone. He'll be very keen to get on well with Boris Johnson. But it does sound like he's basically, from behind the scenes, he's more or less siding with the EU on the disputes over Northern Ireland. So he'll probably push that a bit um, as well. But I, I think the G7, big picture, that, um, and I should also add his tax plan to mm -hmm. try and get a 15% corporate tax worldwide. Um, though I think that will have lots, of, I suspect the G7, that will go very well. But I think it'll have lots of problems after the G7. Right. And of course, uh, there's already kickback from back home from the Republicans on, on his tax plan. In a sense, this is a very economic tour because he's packing in so many different meetings. The one-to-ones the, the, the -one with, uh, with several leaders, including, as you just mentioned, Boris Johnson, uh, with, with the Turkish president and with the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. Uh, as well as the G7, uh, the uh, European Union, and and NATO, so packing an awful lot into these into these uh, six days. His message seems to be very much that uh, the United States is back, as he as he stated when when he first became president. This is this his PR theme for uh, for for the for the moment. Do you think? I think very much. I think also just a practical point of view. Bo, obviously, some of these leaders have changed since 2016. But because he was vice president for eight years and a very prominent senator before, he knows quite a lot of these people somewhat. And as we all know in life, there's a big, if you know someone slightly already, an hour meeting is a lot easier to reestablish a relationship than it is to create one. So I, 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 th I think that should be seen as a factor. But I, I definitely agree that the, that's the big PR picture he's trying to share, say. I think one message Joe Biden and to a less degree his administration is trying to send as well though, is don't expect too much change. So we are still very worried about China. We are still a lot less pro-free trade than people have been used to the United States doing. So I think that will also be a subtle element of his message as well. Don't expect too much change from President Trump, um, as well as a louder message of, look how different we are, everyone loves me, 
Um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, there, there is a, there's a focus on things like the uh, a global um, tax rates, which was discussed last weekend. Um, uh, there's, there's also the, uh, the question of vaccine distribution, and uh, they're just, uh, the US, had, just ahead of this tour, just made a, a large uh, donation to the international pool for, uh, for vaccines. Um, but there's also the issue of climate change. Is, is there any chance that are meetings like this just the icing on the cake, or, or do, um, do decisions actually get made uh, at these? A, a useful, cynical comment, I would say <clears throat> decisions can be made, particularly at bilateral level, but to a large degree, they are often agreed beforehand. And I think that's more or less what's happened in this case, because um, it's basically already been agreed that G7 is going to support a 15 percent tax. Uh, everyone, in principle, is very pro-vaccine, quite rightly. I don't think one's likely to see anything wildly new come out of this meeting, though I might be surprised. Um, and on the um, if climate change, again, I think there's a general agreement. They all agree climate change is a big problem, and which is obviously not the same thing. There should be new policies to try and reduce emissions. But obviously, these people, I know it's hard to think of this, given how powerful they are, have limited power. And that includes um, President Biden. Um, and the fact is, if he actually wants to change policy on tax and um uh, and get this international agreements. If they're to be binding, they need to go through the U.S. Senate, which you require a two-thirds majority. The U.S. Senate's half Republican. I think chances of him getting a two-thirds majority for anything on climate change or tax that he wants is very low. And so that means any decisions, A, they might not actually be implemented in the United States, and B, the, the, they'll have a post-date. You know, Republicans aren't going to be out of power forever. Now, uh, we've already discussed the optics from, uh, from what Joe Biden might hope to, to gain from this, but we, we remember the, 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 uh, the previous um, four years with the, with the memes that would come out after the meetings that, uh, that Donald Trump had. Um, and also the press coverage that, that those meetings received. How, how are the people in the United Kingdom receiving Joe Biden as, as, as the new US president on this visit? Um, I mean, I think if I was going to say the biggest change, it might be there's less attention being paid. Like right. Donald Trump, of course, came out of the media. And so he was always great at grabbing attention, even when, on those occasions when the US president isn't that relevant. Um, Joe Biden, I think almost deliberately, and this is probably better for his approval, doesn't do that. I think there's generally a benevolent attitude towards Joe Biden. The one, uh, um, and on climate change and tax, at least for now, there's a reasonably strong consensus in British politics. That might change if conservative party leadership changes, but certainly true at the moment. But I, one thing I'd say is there is a lot of discontent in Northern Ireland. The National Security Advisor has been very clear that the protocol as currently implemented isn't acceptable and the UK won't implement it. Um, UK, I would say, maybe I'm biased, has a quite a strong case in principle on this. Um, and Joe Biden appears, we've been very careful just to say the peace process is really important. We don't want difficulties in public. Behind the scenes, he seems to be closer to the EU on this. And that does create lots of tensions. So if it flared up massively and Joe Biden sided openly with the EU, that might create a backlash. But I think the chances of this happening during G7 are quite low. This is more something that will come to a crunch afterwards. Uh, starting with a, a, a broad shot of um, particularly European leaders as, as well as uh, a few other countries like Japan uh, in, in the next couple of days, ahead of his meeting with Vladimir Putin, um, how do you think that that, that will affect the, the, these coming days will affect the, the discussion that, uh, that Biden and Putin will be having later this week? Um, I, I think it would be very close to what you were saying before, which is these things tend to be an icing on the cake. I think they're a fairly good idea. I mean, this was it, there was a very power, poor no, no, narrative on this because of the idea that President Trump was super pro-Russian. But the truth is, Joe Biden hasn't actually changed policy much. And um, the European countries, particularly Germany, are probably more pro-Russian. So this happened recently where Biden refused to implement sanctions on Germany for building a pipeline for Russian oil. Um, so I, I think there might be a lot of tough talk, particularly for the media, but I doubt there's going to be anything radical. And one aspect, obviously, is to some degree you have to prioritise this thing. I think the Biden administration seems to want to prioritise China as a greater strategic threat. 
And that's one thing where the G7 might be somewhat important, because the Japanese government is also very worried about China. And of course, they're the second biggest economy in the G7. So they very much matter there. So mm -hmm. I think there will be a, sort of a lot of easiness on Russia, with the UK actually probably being about the most anti-Russian. But I think also there will also be some sort of discussion of China with the US and Japan, perhaps even more Japan, being very much on the hawkish end. Well, um, thank you for, for that analysis. I probably should have changed the analogy from icing on the cake to the clotted cream on the scone, as they're in St Ives. Um, yeah. Also more palatable. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today here on The Edge and giving us your perspective. Thank you. Uh, US President Joe Biden and British Prime Minister Boris Johnson are two very different men leading two countries whose relationship makes up one of the most important global alliances. Both will enter this weekend's diplomatic gathering under pressure to define their respective roles in the world, among other global powers. We'll keep reporting on the developments at the 47th G7, 47th G7 summit. But for now, let's move on to our next topic and discuss another global debate, namely vaccine passports. The procedures for the launch of the COVID-19 certificate have been completed by the EU Commission, and it now remains up to the member states to implement them in the coming weeks our following infographic explains how it works. The European Parliament has given a final nod to the EU COVID vaccine certificate, which will apply to both EU citizens and third country nationals. The European Parliament gave final approval to the COVID-19 digital certificate, a smartphone app that European Union citizens can use to travel freely among European countries without having to quarantine or undergo extra tests. The regulations governing the use of the document were adopted in two votes at the European Parliament in Strasbourg. The lawmakers also secured an agreement that member nations would not insert additional rules on those carrying the certificates. Member nations must now give their approval to the app, which is viewed as a formality. The programme is expected to begin on the 1st of July, and all EU countries must recognise certificates issued by other EU countries. The passes will be issued by individual nations and not from a centralised European authority. They will contain a QR code with advanced security features, while personal data will not be shared with other countries. In a statement, the European Parliament said that all EU countries must accept vaccination certificates issued by other member states for vaccines authorised by the European Medicines Agency. And I'm now joined live from Rabat in Morocco by Dr. Azadine Ibrahimi, who's the director of the BioNova Research Centre. Dr. Ibrahimi, thank you so much for joining me here again today on The Edge. My pleasure, Andy, my pleasure. Many countries like Turkey already have locally uh, used uh, applications for uh, uh, vaccination certificates and status certificates regarding COVID-19. Well, what's, what's the importance of an EU-wide uh, uh, certification scheme? Well, I would have to start with the, the Turkey decision and compare it to the Moroccan one. Actually, the two ministers, the two foreign ministers, the Moroccan one and the Turkish one, agreed actually that there will be a circulation of population between the two countries based on the, the past, the, the health passes 
and the certificates, uh, vaccination certificates of the two countries. And that's great, actually. At least if I'm not going to Europe, I would be coming to, to Turkey and I invite lots of uh, Turkish people to visit Morocco. A good coming choice. back to. <laughs> yeah, I think so. But coming back to the, the, the European decision, I think the European decision are trying to, to play it as a block. I think there was different uh, discussion between different countries, but I think it's uh, based on all what's happening around the world. What we are trying to do, and that we have to say it, is to have an easy way to let people circulate and the movement will be easier. So the Europeans, since they have a lot of affinity between them, they decided after many months, I mean, we have to say that, they discussed it for many months and they gave it different names. And finally, by the beginning of 1st of July, they will have this pass that will allow people within the European countries to, to circulate without any problems based on three uh, principles. Either you are fully vaccinated and you can move without any problem and you have your certificate, either you are negatively actually tested for the COVID in a short period of time, or the third thing that a lot of people are forgetting, either you can actually get the virus, develop an immunity, and you can show it through a certificate. So these three criteria will allow actually people to move within the European. The third part is that will be another discussion because I see that Europe is using lots of colors, red, red, green, yellow for different countries, and we can come back and discuss it if you want. So, um, obviously, there are a lot of details to be encapsulated in this and, and local uh, needs to be accounted for. As we've seen restrictions changing from country, from country to country, from day to day, so it's a very fluid situation. So, uh, will these, are these certificates um, uh, constantly updated by a central database or, or, uh, or do they have an expiration date? How, how, how do they actually work? Well, actually, I think in Europe it will be very complicated because what's happened is just a lot of people, they are against discrimination because they think that if you are using this pass, you'll be discriminating against people that they don't want to to vaccinate or the other thing that uh, you will be sharing information and that's people they don't want to do that. So the discussion really mounted into that in Europe. But finally, I think you could share just a minimum of data, personal data, but you cannot share all the data. But I think that will be the issue. The other issue, can you actually come up with the, a false certificate? That will be something to look for. I think a lot of people can see an opportunity to make a lot of false certificates. The third thing that I would love to come back to it, because I think it's the same thing like in Turkey and Morocco, is the vaccines that we are using, are they will be recognized in Europe or not? And I think it's a big discussion because the EU actually left to each country to have its own uh, kind of standards. So you see, for example, in France, they don't accept the Chinese vaccines and the, the purpose or the cause of that saying that they have to wait for the EMA, the meaning the European agency to to accept or actually to authorize this vaccine. So it will be lots of uh, decision depending on each country. And, and that's a very interesting point that you bring up because it's very important that uh, with the that we've discussed before, the, there are a wide range of vaccines available and generally speaking, their efficacy is, is uh, pretty much on a par. So to, to exclude vaccines that the World Health Organization, for example, has approved, seems to be um, seems to be a full step. Well, I agree with you, Andy. I'm really I have no clue why they are doing. I, I can say some really political decision and mm -hmm. economic, but I'm not going to go there. I will just stay with science. But I will say from the scientific point of view, if you are not uh, applying all what the WHO is doing, you are weakening more and more this organization. How come you can actually uh, get the, the WHO to authorize and accredit all these 
vaccines, the Sputnik, for example, the Sinovac, for example, the Sinopharm. And after that, you have country like France saying, we are not going to authorize this kind of uh, vaccinated population for not whatever reason. And I think for not a scientific reason, definitely. I think that will be mixed into a big discussion because you could come back and actually have people on, in need. And I'm thinking about uh, students, for example. We have a lot of students that cannot travel anymore because they have this kind of vaccine. More than that, you have Hungary. Hungary is a European country that are using Sinopharm. So what are you going to do when this kind of people will be coming to France or to Spain? I think it's a discussion will be there. And I don't want to bring up the discrimination word because I don't like it that much. Well, sadly, it's one that, that will be applied, and perhaps uh, these people should should come on their holidays to Morocco and Turkey anyway, right? Forget the rest of Europe. But uh, coming back to the issue of fraud, um, this obviously is um, is something very dangerous because um, because it's the potential to take the focus off the real issue here, which is eradicating the pandemic, and and putting the the focus on having a piece of something, either a, a digital certificate or a piece of paper that, um, that says, I'm, I'm all right. Um, there, there's the risk that people will be using this for, for, uh, for making opportunities for scams, selling these certificates, which I think are, are going to be free. So is it taking the focus off the real important issues? I agree with you. Actually, I would have loved actually to discuss with you today the fact that uh, the U.S. will be offering 500 million doses of vaccine. I think that's a great news, actually. But I think what we'll be discussing more and more, this uh, new filiere in kind of that will be using frauds and scams to have this certificate. The other thing that I should bring to the table, actually, what about the rest of the world? What about Africa another time? Mm -hmm. It's injustice. It's unfair that you are vaccinating 30% of the population of Europe and you are just closing your door and letting people circulate in your place. But as I said, and we discussed it before, Andy, sometimes you can get uh, really bitten by this kind of decision because you can see easily that uh, a new mutant in this kind of country that we are lifting out maybe comes back and hunts Europe and the rest of the world. And well, I don't want to see that. And, and, uh, and, and indeed, you're quite right to, to bring it up. Let's, let's throw, throw the, uh, for, for our last couple of moments, minutes, let's just discuss the, the distribution of vaccines and, and the importance of continuing to, to follow the protocols to protect ourselves and our neighbours from, uh, from COVID-19. So what are the issues there? I think two things are very important. I think we have to speed up the process of bringing uh, vaccines to other countries. It's a really crucial. And we saw it in, in India, in Brazil, in other countries. I think we have not to go uh, through all this kind of discrimination or all this light because red light, green light, yellow light, because between the yellow and the green, you could have a lot of other colors, actually. So uh -huh. it's not good. But I think the issue is bringing more vaccines to uh, countries like uh, in Africa, because that's very important. And this have this kind of fairness. And I think maybe what's going to happen, the people, they will see the virus are more fair than other humans that actually live in out other countries and just thinking about themselves. And I think the solution, as I said, and we agreed on it a couple of times on this show, Andy, mm -hmm. is just without justice. Uh, vaccinal justice, I think it will have, will stay there, and maybe a lot of other repercussion will be happening in the world because this injustice can fit up and fill up a lot of sentiment and resentment on these countries, and it will be tough to take it out a few years down the road. So, uh, as, while protecting ourselves locally, we absolutely need to protect ourselves internationally at the same time, Globally. Or, or, or there's there's nothing happening, and, and of course, just just finally, um, people mustn't take their eyes off the off the simple things, the masks, the hand washing, and so on. Uh, that, that's yeah. correct as well, isn't it? I forgot about that. I think it's great that you brought up this question again because I think there is a personal issue. Each one of us should understand that we are coming out of this crisis 
not only because we have politics and strategies and plans, no, because each person of us actually did its bit of fighting this this virus and fighting this crisis. And I think we, kept, we have to keep in mind that changing our culture vis-a-vis -vis the, 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 the viruses, vis-a-vis -vis the pandemics, uh, it's very important. And we can see the example on the east side of the world, because when you see the numbers in Japan, in China, in Taiwan, in Korea, what they are better than us is the way that they are facing this virus. As soon as they know that there is a virus, there is a pandemic, they mask up, and that's very important. Distanciation is something that is very important, and the hygiene is very important. I think this kind of uh, culture we have to implement, and an example, a nice example to give to everybody. This year around the world, we didn't have any influenza, actually, uh, crisis, simply because we use this gesture that are very simple, can protect us against the COVID, the coronavirus, but can, can protect against the other uh, kind of diseases. I know that in Turkey and Morocco, we like hugging, touching, but I think this Mediterranean kind of criteria, we should just leave it a little bit out and get another culture of kin kind of, we can be nice to each other and love each other without touching. It's a really philosophical kind of thinking. Indeed. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us and we'll carry on loving the world. Dr. Azadin Ibrahimi, thank you so much for joining me today on The Edge. Thank you. European COVID-19 travel certificate has been created by the European Union in a bid to restore freedom of travel, which has been brought to a halt for over a year. Those holding such document will be able to travel throughout Europe without the need to quarantine or test for COVID-19. We hope that these measures can somehow revive the travel industry, which is in crisis. For now, let's move on to our final topic, Euro 2020, which finally kicks off on Friday with the opening match between Turkey and Italy. With almost all host cities having to manage vastly reduced stadium capacities because of COVID-19 pandemic that's ravaged football across the continent, Euro 2020 won't quite have the same atmosphere as previous years. Our infographic has more facts about the tournament. Talented Turkish side, mostly built around young players, will take on European veteran Italy in Rome's Stadio Olimpico on Friday to kick off the COVID-delayed Euro 2020. Turkey coach Şenol Güneş will be looking to repeat the success of his 2002 World Cup campaign in which he led the team to an unexpected third-place finish when they play at Euro 2020. Led by influential captain Burak Yilmaz, who is having a brilliant season at Lille, Turkey go into the campaign with a mix of youth and experience. The balance seems to work as they grabbed wins against Netherlands and Norway in World Cup qualifiers this year. The 68-year-old Gunesh has been back at the helm since 2019, having previously been in charge from 2000 to 2004 and achieved Euro 2020 qualification after a dismal Nations League campaign in which Turkey came bottom of League B with one win. In the Euro 2020 qualifiers, Turkey finished second behind France, but above Iceland, Albania, Aldora and Moldova. 
Turkey exited Euro 2016 at the group stage, but will look for inspiration from their third place finish at the Euro 2008. Burak Yilmaz is one of two players to have played for all of Turkey's big four clubs, Fenerbahce, Besiktas, Galatasaray and Trabzonspor. He is Turkey's leading active scorer and the second highest in their history, with 28 goals and 66 appearances. Yilmaz is expected to take the main striking position as he did in World Cup qualifying, with an attacking trident of Kenan Karaman on the left and Yilmaz's little teammate Yusuf Yazıcı or Leicester City's Cengiz Ündar on the right. Another of Turkey's strengths is the middle of the defense, with Leicester's Çalar Soyuncu, Liverpool's Ozan Kabak and Juventus's Merih Demiral fighting for a starting spot. And I'm joined from Leeds in England by Peter Hall, who's a sports journalist. Peter, thank you for joining us today here on The Edge. So you're looking all ready and excited for Euro 2020 to begin uh, on Friday. Uh, what is, the, um, what is the, the, the key thing for sports fans about this, this competition with, with all the differences that have, are going to be taking place? Well, it's it's been a long time coming, hasn't it? We've had we've had to wait for for an extra year for this tournament, and everybody loves a summer tournament, really. No matter how good the season is, no matter how big the season is, um, the domestic season that is. Um, but this is an unprecedented tournament because it's all over, all over Europe. It's something that uh, has never been done before. It's a new format, and it, it gives it gives this tournament a, 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 something a little bit different. Uh, some teams have an advantage because of it, some don't. And um, it just makes that summer tournament that little bit more exciting because we've never seen anything like this before. And it'll be interesting to see how, how it works, uh, if teams can take advantage of, like for England, for example, all the teams that, all the games that they have being in, um, in this country, the, the semi final in, in, in England, the final in England. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big, especially with fans um, allowed to attend, it's a, it can be a big advantage, but it'll be interesting to see how that pans out for other countries as well. Uh, in, in a sense, this, uh, this almost makes the idea of a, a, a Euro competition more, more real because uh, it's not being farmed off to one little corner somewhere. It, it, because it's spread out, it, uh, does that add excitement, do you think, to the, to the tournament? I think so. And it, it gives it gives the people. I know not as many fans will be allowed to attend games, but it gives fans in each individual country um, the chance to experience a tournament that may not have had one before, mm. uh, and to get behind your country. You know, it, Italians can go and see it, it, game Italy games at European Championships in Italy. Um, this the same with Germany, the same with England. It's 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 a it's a really a, a big thing for fans that might not necessarily have the means to go and travel to the other side of. Europe or the world for a World Cup, um, it gives them an opportunity to see their team in their home country, um, and such a major tournament as well. I think it, I think it's, it opens it up to a, a, a wider audience, and that surely can only be a good thing. Now there, there are different groups uh, in the in the tournament. Um, uh, do any groups have particular advantages over the others? Can you give us a spoiler alert for what you think is going to happen in this competition? <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> I think that, um, I th and that not, not necessarily some teams have got an advantage. I think if you look at Portugal, Germany and France, that's it, all in the same group. That's a big disadvantage. There's a, ch there's a big chance that one of the big players in European football could go out at the group stage. Um, England will fancy the chances with the group they've got, even with, even with um, you know, up against the old enemy in Scotland. Um, they will, England will really fancy the chances of getting out of the group. The problem is, is that after that, should they win the group, it could be Portugal, France or Germany in the round of 16, which England's track record in tournaments against, against big nations is not all that great. Um, so I think Italy have got um, a favourable group. and I, I, do, I do fancy Italy to go all the way and they're my tip to win it purely on the, on based on the fact that they have the best defence, 25 unbeaten under Roberto Mancini, not conceded in the last seven. Um, uh, in tournaments like this, tight tour tournaments are often um, so tight and so tightly contested. It's the team with the best defence that wins it. Look at Portugal at the last one. They defended, they defended so well. They won games 1-0 on penalties. 
Um, Italy have got a fantastic goalkeeper in Donnarumma, so I really fancy them to go all the way. Now, obviously, there are winners and losers um, in, a, in a tournament, but also because of the delay, there are some winners and losers, some uh, players who were hoping to, to play if, the, if it had been held last year, actually in 2020, uh, now are out of the game, and, uh, and others who maybe weren't able to play either because of injury or because they hadn't grown into the, 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 the level required um, before mm -hmm. now. Um, are, are winners because now they're able to participate. So are there any names that have come and gone, have been, have been affected by this year's delay? I think so. I think, I think more, I think the fact that you're right to point to the fact that it gives, it gives players an extra year to, to make a name for themselves. And this tournament perhaps would have come uh, too early for certain players. Uh, I'm, I'm, from an English point of view, Phil Foden is is as an exciting a player we've had in England for many years. He's been being compared to Paul Gascoigne. And if this would have come a year ago, he wasn't in the Manchester City team. He wasn't playing very often. Now, uh, a year on, this season, he's been arguably one of Manchester City's most important players, played in all the big games. He's the guy that Pep Guardiola goes to. And now um, he's one of the first names on the England team sheet. Are you you're talking about building a team around Phil Foden, which a year ago you wouldn't even think he'd, he'd have got in the squad. So there's a lot of young players like that who um, have had that extra year to prove themselves. Uh, Pedri is another, is another one for, the, for Spain, who uh, is now a first-team regular at Barcelona. Um, he's had um, an extra season to get into the team, and now he's, uh, he's one of the most exciting players to watch at this tournament. Well, uh, well, we're all excitedly watching here to see Turkey move forward towards the finals, we hope, this time. Um, Peter Hall, thank you so much for joining us today and giving us your insights on Euro 2020. Thank you. And indeed, we're all waiting for the opening match between Turkey and Italy on Friday and wish all the teams good luck and hope for an exciting tournament. Our analysts provide the insights on today's top stories. Let's have a roundup of what they had to say. And before closing our programme, let's have a look at social media to hear your voices and reactions on today's top stories with Miriam Carlson. Hello, are you welcome to Euro 2020? If you are, you are not alone. Because um, today we're taking a look at the world of sports with the trending topics on social media. The hashtag Euro 2020. Let's have a look. And there has been a lot of exciting people here, so let's take a look at a few and see what they are saying. Gareth McNamara is saying Euro 2020 is starting tomorrow. I'm just curious whose people tipped is to win it. Two choices for me, Portugal and Germany. And moving on to another one, we can see that Dr. Reza Pachisade is saying, are you ready for Euro 2020? Never watch TV, but I already bought my subscription for this stupendous event. Being an old England fan, those hearts also has room for Portugal and Spain. And one's great but not fallen colonial powers. Moving on to Portuguese soccer. That is a dedicated fan, isn't it? 
saying Portugal has departed for Budapest and Euro 2020's group of deaths that will be more challenging with this edition's current setup as they play two nations in their group in their home stadiums. And in the video of the day, we are taking a look back and taking a look at the moments of the European UEFA Football Championship in previous years. Let's see. And this is all the football you get from me for now. Back to Andy. And that's all from this episode of The Edge with me, Andy Boyne. Stay tuned as we'll be back tomorrow with more in-depth analysis on the top stories and a look beyond the edge.